wave at the at our viewers. Hi viewers. <laughs> viewers. Okay, so it's the Meg John and Justin podcast. Yay! Hello. Woo! We've calmed down the A's and the woes, haven't we, during COVID? <laughs> that we used to kind of yell oh. them like Kermit. Yeah, it's good because oh. actually, also, it's it's hard. It makes it harder to edit on the on <laughs> when we're itself. really yelling. <laughs> <laughs> I think you were nearly going to bring us down a, a a black hole of the Muppet Show again. So let's not go there. Oh yeah, let's not do. We that. have we have started podcasts that way before. <laughs> <laughs> we have we have, and also this is going to be a, a long one. We think so. It might yes. be that because we've done a lot of prep for this one, we've kind of done this a bit mm. differently. Well, we've done, both done a bit of reading, and we both put loads of things <laughs> in the coupon dog. So <laughs> got a lot to get through. So consider this like a double episode, dear listener. Like yeah. consider this like um, consider this like two weeks worth of episodes, right? So um, because we're going to talk about sadness and it's a big topic and it's a lot to be sad about so um welcome dear listener we uh if you if this is the first time listening to us we're that's meg john although i'm probably pointing in the wrong direction and i'm justin we are <laughs> <laughs> we do these podcasts which um are about sex and relationships and our relationships to the world and our relationship to ourselves um very broad there's always a blowjob tip at the end. And, every time. Uh, every single time. <laughs> uh, this one is about sadness and being sadness. We've done one about joy and we've done one about anger. Mm. Uh, we also did one about like the feeling of hopelessness as well, didn't we? So oh, yeah, hopelessness and despair. Maybe yeah. a little overlap with that one. Um, yeah, well, we're going through we, all of our we are. We'll emo- all the emotions. The emotions. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> what have we got left? Fear, disgust. Yeah. A surprise that's a feeling surprise yeah Mm -hmm. some people add peaceful and powerful as well okay yeah we could do all of those we could Um, so uh (laughs) we also will write up a blog about this episode uh which you'll be able to see at our website megjohnandjustin.com we also have a patreon where if you subscribe to our patreon you will get extra bonus podcasts so pretty much every other podcast we do is for patrons at our Patreon, which is at patreon.com forward slash Meg, John and Justin. Uh, the links will be in the thing thing and in the what's it. So that's clear. Yeah, definitely so, all over it. <laughs> thing thing and what's it. <laughs> yeah. Right, so um, we're going to talk about, sad, we'll, let's structure what it is that we're going to talk about. So we're going to talk yeah. about how to be with sadness. And yeah, how to we get well we're... with others, and how we can. what well, we're going to chat ourselves about how we're feeling and whether we're feeling sad. We're going to talk about what is sadness and sorrow and grief, and unpack it. We're going to talk about staying mm. with sadness, sadness and connection and grief. We're also yeah. going to talk about sadness as a resource and injustice, and compare it to what we were talking about with anger. We're mm-hmm. going to talk about intersectionality: who's allowed to be sad and when and then there's going to be some takeaways at the end which is uh things to leave you with dear listener about how <laughs> not, you might not like to... thai takeaway or indian takeaway sadly not uh no but though you could have a takeaway while you're listening to this recommended i'm now thinking about having a takeaway <laughs> later <'cause laughs> well isn't it your takeaway day friday yeah didn't you choose like between fish and chips and pizza last time yeah i went with chips fish and chips that feels like yesterday. <laughs> yeah. Motoring. Uh, like I said, you know, my days are kind of intermingling, and maybe I'm kind of maybe my response is to to be like disconnected and just to mm. uh, and just to kind of you know um, work, eat, watch telly, go to bed, wake up, do the same. You know, so maybe I'm. Maybe I can heartily rec- I can heartily recommend going through an intense process of trauma recovery because I feel like <laughs> last Friday was like a million years ago. So I've yeah, been through so that, much since then. If that sounds really great from my it's end. just I mean, great. Valuable, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I do not recommend it unless unless you need to be going through it. Yeah, but if you want to follow my blog on rewritingtherules.com, oh, you can hear a lot about what I'm going through. <laughs> excellent stuff. Really Thank useful you. stuff. <laughs> um, I'm learning a lot from reading it. It's so good. Yeah. 
So um, let, we'll do a check in with ourselves, MJ. Mm -hmm. So I'm not really feeling a, I'm feeling a lot of anger, particularly this week because of being gaslit by the government over the Dominic Cummings affair and then coming on the media and just basically lying and then they're laughing at us and yeah. it makes me feel very powerless and uh, I'm definitely feeling kind of seething anger and also a bit of hopelessness and despair. So, um, but I've not felt, I wouldn't say I felt sad for a while. Sadness isn't something that I've been feeling over the last few weeks, but I was thinking that when I was doing some reading for this and doing a bit of writing about it, that might actually be quite useful for me to have a sad day or two, you know. Um, mm. How are you getting on? Yeah, like I hit some sadness this morning, which felt appropriate, mm. um, given what we were going to be talking about. Um, and yeah, I mean, we'll talk about it more in a podcast, but I think for me, there is something quite beautiful about sadness, especially when you're grappling with maybe harsher feelings like anger and shame um, or maybe anger out and anger in, I suppose, is, is kind of mm. what that is. Um, that sometimes reaching that point of sadness can be quite a relief um, mm. and a kind of, it can kind of ventilate, it can kind of release it. So I mm. tried to let myself, you know, like have a cry this morning and yeah, I just really feel for exactly like you say, what's going on, the, yeah, just that awful feeling of powerlessness, really seeing how people are being like differentially treated you know re and just especially after the um killing of george floyd by police in minneapolis mm -hmm. recently that sort of sense of just had this ricocheting of how different people's lives are being valued and not valued at the moment and rich and poor black and white you know trans and cis and just like seeing it all like, all that intersecting and just feeling that as really heavy mm -hmm. um I think, yeah, reaching sadness f around that stuff um, and around the, the places that we find ourselves within those those systems and that, like you say, the sense of powerlessness around a lot of it. Um, mm. To me, that's it's a valuable place to get to. Um, it, it helps um, mm. to, to release some of the feeling and also to feel, yeah, I guess it does make me feel quite um, motivated to do something mm -hmm. when I've given that when I've given that sadness some some time just to be. Mm. yeah okay so let's go on to our yeah. first section where we'll talk about what it is um, yeah before we then start unpacking it and talking about <laughs> what we usually do which is politics and yes we'll get, we'll get that <laughs> <laughs> don't worry dear listener we're, we're on that so um sadness is something that i think that we want to it feels like it's an emotion that we kind of want to avoid. And I was reading one of my, um, I've got this, uh, I won't, I won't um, diss the author publicly, but I've got a, a book for young people about building confidence and stuff. It's like, and I bought it years ago because it has some good activities in it. And I thought, oh, what's that got to say about sadness? Mm. I went to sadness and it said, you know, sadness uh, makes you feel, you know, heavy and, uh, down and lethargic and grey, and it's best to be avoided. <laughs> like, <fuck> what? <laughs> so I put, oh, that book, but I put that. I'm gonna put it actually down in the bin. Yeah. <laughs> because I really don't think. I really hope I never thought, but I really don't think that sadness is something that we should avoid. But it's something that we yeah. are encouraged to avoid. I think. Mm -hmm. um, it's seen as something which is inherently negative, and I think first and foremost that we shouldn't judge any feelings as, or emotions as being inherently negative or positive I think that it's mm. you have to treat it for where it is don't you but I do and I think in some ways it's uh it can be any you know get well again I got brought up definitely with a you know it's never okay to be sad and somehow that's a you know it's not okay to give people the impression you're sad because you're somehow doing something bad for them if you're sad you know and that kind of thing but um I now when I feel it it does have I mean, like we'll get into those different versions of it, I suppose, but it does have this really beautiful quality. Mm. Um, you know, to me, it, it feels nearly as pleasant as joy, if I can yeah. really allow myself to feel it. It's just a really beautiful, tender, soft, gentle feeling. You know, I think it's, it's yeah, easier, easier on <laughs> the body and brain for me than, the, than that anger or a fear, you know, which can feel quite harsh, you know, those feelings. 
um, well, whilst also of, being very valid. It's mm. kind of slower, isn't it? It's, yeah. Um, I value it for when I have felt sad and when I've been able to articulate to one of my strategies is to tell my inner circle that I'm mm. feeling sad via WhatsApp and say, you know, so just so you know, I'm going to be quiet for the next couple of days, having an attack yeah. of the sad. Um, mm. I'll let you know if I need anything, but you know, that's why I'm being quiet. And I've texted that to you and uh, other of my uh, close people. And it's like, um, cool, Justin, thanks for letting us know, you know, I'm here for you, mate, you know, just stuff this mm. from quoting kind of thing you would say. But if you're, if you're in that kind of, once you've made that space, there isn't something necessarily to fear about it either. For me, mm. um, yeah, I do get that sense of it's, um, I find it valuable and uh, kind of, uh, yeah, there is like a, some kind of a pleasure to it, I think. I don't know, it just feels so, mm. it just feels like so one of those really raw feelings that they, the thing that I take away from it is just to be like, whoa, you know, yeah, be like recovering after laughter, you know, when you're laughing and you're mm. really in your body, it's like, oh, you've just felt something so much. If I have like left a, a, a nightclub where I've been dancing and that, that moment when I come out and there's been so much joy and I'm like, oh, that was just, you know, yeah. was it? All I can say is it was a feeling coursing through my veins. And I definitely get that with sadness as well. It's a very releasing one, if, again, if you can allow it, especially if you can allow tears or sobbing or, you know, any, any kind of yeah. expression of it. But even if you can just actually sit with the tenderness of it and the rawness of it, I think, yeah, it can really release. You know, that's, that's why I think particularly embracing of it at the moment like if I get to sadness it means I've got kind of we'll get to this I suppose but underneath often the harder feelings that I have been feeling particularly around shame and fear yeah. like it's such a relief to get to just this like oh the sadness for me going through this for anyone else going through this it's just mm. like you know something starts to flow again and also yeah. I think it can again if you can let it it can enable a real gentleness you know mm. if like you'd be with somebody who was sad or an animal who was sad or a kid who was sad you know mm. can you be with if you can be with yourself like that and like really tuck yourself up get yourself a hot chocolate you know yeah. it's an emotion that to me now anyway it calls to that kind of treatment mm. um from from myself and others i think the kind of descriptors that i would use for how it how what what it feels like to be sad like what or how it's how it appears to me and how it how it is it's, it feels very internal mm. uh, and I feel um it's kind of like a grayness and like uh I feel quite listless and also quite heavy and um that I'm only that I'm only capable of doing very small yeah very small things uh, and that in that space I'm able able to do like self-care and you know nurturing practices definitely but just not a lot of things you know I can yeah do small amounts of things and then I need to put in huge slowness huge gaps we've done a podcast recently about this and it's like mm. and that is the way of getting through it and you know when I've done it and I've come out the other side of it I feel better as a result it is that relief mm. that we're talking about and Jake yeah I'm gonna do my yeah. first name drop uh, go on the, you know i'm trying to do more reading about more things so um you know i'm trying to learn more and that's one of my it was kind of a new year's resolution to do more reading and to kind of mm. pay a bit more you know to in broaden my political and education but also my general education so yeah I, no well i feel the same and inspired by you to often look to the more political podcasts and things which is good so i been looking mm. at the work of one Donald Winnicott, who is uh, you'll know about you know about Winnicott MJ. So uh, he yeah. was uh, um, like, would you say like psychodynamic uh, child family therapy guy? Is that right? Yeah, exactly. Definitely followed on from Freud and Co. Yeah, and he mm. wrote this um, brief essay that I found online called "The Value of Depression," and mm. he's talking about. So his, this is like 1964. So, and he's kind of resisting the kind of the quite medicalized term that we have for depression at the moment. But I think that mm. his, where he's talking about depression, I would say read sadness um, because I don't think he's talking about depression as it would be read in 2020. Um, yeah. 
but uh, he's saying some really useful things. And essentially, he's saying that um, that there is a paradox of sadness, that it's something that we uh, we try to avoid and we try to negate in, negate in other people and prevent other people from having it. And actually, yeah. that's counter what we actually should be doing. That there's something inherently valuable in um, in being sad and feeling mm. sad. He first of all talks about this in terms of like uh, part of growing up, like part of maturation. So the mm -hmm. idea that as you grow up, that the idea the idea is that um, it's part of the that the ability to feel sad is a sign of your I amness. He calls it so the the sign that you are understanding that there is a you and other people, and also that there mm -hmm. is a an inner you and an outer you. So the, the yeah. idea of I can't remember his term, uh, e -stru e structural ego or ego, ego structure or something. But I don't uh, go in for the psychodynamic terms too much and I'm not no. a psychologist. And you are, and I feel like this is stupid. No, we, they don't, no, we don't, we don't, no, we don't <laughs> study. They don't, they don't let us study psychoanalysis in psychology. Really? Where, yeah, no, that's the big fight is like the proper psych science psychology versus the psychoanalysis. So actually right. psychoanalysis is something I've only read about in quite recent years and found some value in it as well. So yeah, but I don't, I'm not familiar with this. Yeah. I'll tell you how I got to this is that I've heard you speak about Winnicott and I've heard my friend Captain mm. Angel speak about Winnicott and I saw his yeah. name on, like, online and I thought, okay, well, he must have something good to say about, <laughs> about sadness. <laughs> and he does. So Yay. that's literally where I'm at with my, I'm literally just drifting around trying to find interesting bits and bobs online. Um, so he then kind of goes on to, and he said, he basically says, look, that for most people, what you need to do is to allow mm. it and it's exactly the stuff that you yeah about in staying with feelings it's uh it's you know it's really good stuff and he's saying that really the thing to do is just to allow it and just mm. to um allow your child but also ourselves and others around us just to go through it and come out the other side and that when you do come out of the other side you'll come out stronger and actually you'll mm. it's a valuable experience by having gone through it because it is because particularly for children, because it is a sign of like maturation and then getting a, a sense of, you know, themselves and others. Um, but also um, the, there is a sense of like, the way he talks about it is a sense of boundaries. So uh, an interesting mm. kind of um, way that he talks about it is, this is during, this is in the, the mid sixties. So he refers to Berlin. So mm. with, which at the time Berlin was like ringed off. So Berlin was, uh, uh, certainly West Berlin was um, uh, still controlled by the, by, sorry, uh, by <laughs> the UK, uh, the US and France. Uh, but West Berlin was in, was situated in East Germany. So he was speaking mm -hmm. of West Berlin as being like a ring around which there is a wall, basically. Yeah. But you could think of any like fortified city, basically. And he was saying, if you think about um, sadness or depression as like, that you're in the walls of a fortified city and uh, a fog descends and you can't really see anything and it's murky and the sounds are all dimmed and the sounds are dull. Mm. Occasionally you get cracks of light coming in, but you, you get, a, the way he's talking about it is that, that you, the thing that you get is this sense of the inner that you're in and the mm. sense of an outer and that you know that the fog is going to lift and that what you get afterwards is a great understanding of that inner and outer. Which yeah. I think in and of itself is quite useful. Um, yes. But well, in a vital also, part of maturation. Yeah, that's, well, that's right. Yeah. And mm. he also then talks about um, some of the things that might prevent this, um, yeah. this process from happening. And I just want to read this one bit because it's really good. This is like he talks about the, um, he frames this as the, uh, so, to our surprise, a person may come out of depression stronger, wiser, and more stable than before he or she went into it, or, you know, they. Uh, a great deal depends, however, on the freedom of depression from what might be called impurities. Any attempt uh. will be made to indicate that, well, the nature of, so basically saying that impurities prevent people from coming out of this, and he lists several of them. So uh, he talks about uh, category D impurity. I won't go into so I don't know why he's putting him in categories, but anyway, he's saying um, a different kind of impurity, one which is expressed in, um, uh, I, know, I won't read that bit. Uh, so basically saying look, where depression exists, but is denied or negated, each yeah. of depression, deadness, heaviness, darkness, seriousness, 
is supplanted by its opposite, aliveness, lightness, luminosity, flippancy, etc. Mm. Goes on to say, this is a useful defense, but then the individual pays for it by the return of the inevitable depression to be endured privately. Mm. So it's that. So if somebody steps into your life and says, you know, well, cheer up, or tries to shiver you along, or bounces you on your knee, or something, then yeah. you feel great for five minutes, and then that person goes away, and that person feels more sad, and that's because this person isn't really giving everything that they need. Yeah, um, it really resonates with what I've been reading around both trauma and shame lately. Yeah. So the trauma literature suggests that if you're that sadness and grief are one way of releasing tension. So it, the David Trevelyan book that I read was saying, you know, imagine this um, kid crossing the road and there's a car coming and the parent kind of pulls the kid across the road and they manage to get to the other side and then the kid sobs, you know, and the sort of the tears come. Like that's the really important release of what was a traumatic experience and that can be just moved through. But if that, if the parent tries to stop the child having that reaction which a lot would because there's that sense of like you don't get to be sad or it's you know it's bad to be sad mm -hmm. then that's sort of locked in the body right. um whereas the shame literature talks about the importance of having your emotions regulated by those around you so if you get sad or any other emotion and you get the sense that it can't be held by the people around you because they're telling you you shouldn't have this or it's not okay or it's a bad thing on them or it's hurting them or whatever again you're not you're not being regulated um, and emotional dysregulation like that is what leads to people feeling shame on a kind of toxic level that they're a bad person gotcha. and they're not okay and feeling really unsafe. Um, so it's, yeah, there's a kind of really dangerous impact kind of long-term of denying other people's emotional states. Is it really kind of, yeah, it hampers you in, mm. in all the ways we've talked about before on the podcast, but in those particular ways as well, it can lead to trauma being locked in the body. It can lead to giving people a, a sense of shame. When, when you're in an emotional state, you really need people around you to mirror it and yeah. regulate it and hold it and affirm that it's okay. And if you get the opposite, it really does take a toll, quite a big toll on you, I think. Well, that, I'm going to say something a bit more about that that kind of relates to that when I start talking about um, melancholia mm. uh, in a bit. Uh, but, so let's move on to the to the next section, which is it feels like where we've led in nicely to there about the importance of staying with sadness. Yeah, we've said a lot about this, um, but I want you to say some more about it because we love what you say about it. <laughs> yeah, well, this is it. I mean, it's just this whole idea, and I have got a zine about it on my website, rewritingrules dot com. Um, staying with feelings. Zine. It's Thank free. you. Stupidly, it's free. <laughs> <laughs> you can always support my Patreon if you want to yeah. <laughs> do it that way. Patreon. Yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's all about how to stay with feelings and different practices you can use for staying with them. But you know, we talked about Inside Out, the movie last time, um, the Pixar movie, and actually, this is the specific emotion that Inside Out deals with: is yeah. the idea of what would it be like if you tried to get rid of sadness, yeah. um, and. The, the, the whole thing is that we need to be able to feel all the feelings and probably the ideal would be to be able to be with them all fairly equally in our lives, yeah. you know, like um, there should be just as much sadness as there is those other emotions. Mm -hmm. um, and actually there's a real sense of how it can make things a bit more beautiful in the mm -hmm. movie, the way that the memories that are tainted with sadness, they look more beautiful and complex than the ones that are just pure joy. But I think this is where, you know, again, we, we, you mentioned about sadness versus depression. And I think in Inside Out, the sense is, is, is that if we try and not have any of the feelings, mm. that's when we'll reach depression. And depression is more like this gray, foggy, blunt, blunted kind of place. Mm. Whereas sadness has more, you know, it does have a heaviness and a lowness to it. Um, but, you know, maybe there's something about if we can stay with it as sadness, we may not need to go quite into depression. I, for me, I feel like depression is more like a given up place of like mm. almost not being able to tolerate the sadness so I've gone or the shame or whatever and I've gone all the way to kind of just given up heaviness but it's it's a tricky one because I think that, yeah like you say I like Winnicott's description of maybe like a fair letting yourself go into a fairly brief depression mm. the, that might have that same quality of being able to sort of be there and look after yourself there and move through it so perhaps yeah it's quite complex where the dividing lines are between these things but it, really the message is the more that you can allow you, the feeling whatever the feeling is and the more that you can really just feel it um 
and whether that's just sitting with it and letting yourself feel it on the body or sometimes it can be helpful to think like what texture is this what color is this what sound is this like what tv character would this be you know you can use all kinds of quite practical methods to just really get in touch with what it feels like for you and describe it in a, a rich way yeah and you might have things to go to you know you might have like a, a, a cuddly toy or you might have mm. a food stuff you know there might be like comfort foods there might be a playlist there might be a film you know there is oh, yeah. things that can help you nurture yourself through it and there are things that other people can do for you as well we'll talk about that towards the end with with mm. the, the takeaways bit but um and at no point here whenever we talk about depression and sadness at no point are we you know trying to um give kind of easy answers to how to deal with depression uh, we are talking mm-hmm. about sadness here rather than depression um although there is as NJ was talking about there is a spine line and uh but um that's i guess it's like a a, a spectrum but also there is this medicalized element to depression which is neither good nor bad it's just a different mm. thing isn't it sorry it's just me saying something quite basic <laughs> no it's imp- no it's, it's important because it's not like saying oh like this is oh it's simple no. just be with sadness and then you won't get depressed you know no, or just exactly. be with be with depressed in a little way and you won't have to experience it in a big way it's like you no know, most of us grapple with this stuff our whole lives and and, yeah. and i think it is really good to think back to what were the messages you received growing up about this stuff because for a lot of us it's by no means easy to get in touch with sadness you know no. many of us will be taught it just simply isn't okay or isn't even safe enough to express sadness so you know it may take some time to get to a point where it does feel you know like you can get in touch even with that sadness feeling most of us cover it over with other feelings so you know it can be quite a beautiful gift when you finally get to sadness because you're like oh yeah this is what was underneath all of that other stuff yeah well exactly and that's the that's the thing that some of us are going to find it easy to be sad than others like if it was more okay for us to be sad than we've had if we've had experience of this you know maturation that we talked about Mm. this uh um, of being allowed to feel sad then it's going to feel easier for us um mm. just to uh i was when i was reading winnicott uh he was saying that melancholia is a medieval term so i was like mm. oh right i know do we, do we know anyone who knows anything about medieval I know, yeah i do so yeah. i spoke to <laughs> my girlfriend who was also known as dr eleanor yanniger um I'm just going to read out the WhatsApp chat. Yeah, do it. Because fuck it. <laughs> uh, reading out my girlfriend's WhatsApps. This is <laughs> this is the research I'm doing now. No, but um, I like that we go to all over the. Pa- I've got some tweets later to mention. It, it just you know, it's like it's whatever whatever comes together, and also it's nice and kind of levels out the different forms of expertise, yeah. right? Yeah. I apologise my fault for myself. I shouldn't do that. Anyway, as I said, I've just been reading about sadness and melancholia. A medieval term, apparently. She says, yep. <laughs> uh, linked to excess black bile. And I said, was there a distinction between mourning and melancholia? She says, yeah, because mourning is brought on by a specific incidence of loss and melancholia is linked to a humoral imbalance. So uh, black, so human theory um, is that there are four humours, black bile, yellow bile, water, and wine. Better just double check that. No, blood. Blood, yellow bile. Oh, yeah. Black bile, yellow bile, blood and water. Yeah. And yeah. That you're, that any problems that we say in the medieval period, um, uh, following on from ancient Greek ideas of medicine, I believe they followed Galen's yeah. theory of the four humours and that anything that's wrong with you is basically you've got too much or too little of one of those four things. Anyway, mm. so... Um, Melancholia is linked to a humoral imbalance, so it can be seen as an illness. Melancholic, meanwhile, is a temperament, so you might naturally have a bit more black bile if something bad has happened, if, you, if you're mourning someone or mourning a loss of something or if you're feeling sad. Um, but being prone to melancholy is more like a, like a kind of a condition, like an illness, where you just have more black bile on, a, on an ongoing basis. Um, mm. I've kind of summarised what we were saying there. So um, nice, but this is something that also Freud picked up on as well, which um, I'm going to talk more about this later on when we talk about politics, because I think it, there's an interesting thing that we need to talk about here with politics and activism and how we change the world um, to increase the capacity for us all feeling all the feelings when we want to, rather than having to feel sad mm-hmm. and angry um, and anyway um so 
um, so that where so Freud is again right. So again, I'm, I'm I'm the person doing the Freud stuff. So correct me if I'm wrong here. But there is he was kind of pointing to a difference of that a difference between mourning and melancholia, where mourning is like an event, and we talked about this where just now, where you know a sad thing happens, you're allowed to mourn it, you're allowed to feel sad. People around you give the the, the permission to feel sad. And it moves and you go through it and you come out the other side. That's not to say that's not something you don't then might then not never go back to. You can keep feeling uh, memories of that sadness and you can keep coming back to it um, Mm -hmm. on a regular basis and have, you know, a cry and have, you know, some sad times. And that's and that's still mourning. But he talks about the difference between mourning and melancholia. So melancholia, he was, so I'm reading a quote here that I'm not entirely sure I understand, but then I'll read another quote from George Michael, which gives you my interpretation of how I understand it. <laughs> so he's talking about, uh, so Freud says, a loss of a more ideal kind than mourning. The object has perhaps not actually died, but um, has been lost as an object, ob- object of love. The George Michael quote mm. that this kind of reminds me of is from Jesus to a Child, which is all the mm. which is a magnificent song. Pray for a Saint George, uh, Ore pro nobis, we love you. <laughs> Jesus to a Child was about his uh, his first um, big love, uh, Anselmo, uh, who died of an age related illness. Um, mm. And he wrote a beautiful song about him, which is oh, incredible. Um, and he says in it, and every single memory has become a part of me, and you will always be my love which on the one hand sounds like mourning but also i think sounds like melancholy that there's something Uh, there that he is going back to the 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 the, the, that an imprint has been made on him as uh as a person on his it's kind of got inside his inner i suppose and that it is like a and that there is a holding on there which i think is kind of related to mourning but also sounds like melancholia Um, Mm. So I think that we can be, there is sadness, but then if there is this kind of ongoing holding on of a loss, um, then that is something that Freud interrogates a lot. And also I'm going to come back to when we talk about politics, but I think that there is like a, if we're not allowed just to feel the events and to allow them at the time to happen, then this kind of ongoing kind of sadness that we might talk about that might might become like a depression, or yeah. the evil term um, melancholia is that is something what are we holding on to and there's another quote that kind of reminds me of this is um, uh, Jeanette Winterson wrote this great book called uh, Written on the Body and the opening line of mm. that is why is the measure of love lost and so it's a sense of uh, it's a story about someone who's really heartbroken and it's like that to lose something tells you how much you loved it and so it's almost as if you're holding on to that rather than experiencing the core thing of the of losing someone um, am I yeah you do yeah and it makes me think um yeah judith butler picked up on this freud freud's idea of melancholia around gender because she was kind of talking about the loss that people can feel if they've just closed down options to themselves because they feel like to be a woman they need to close down these aspects that could be seen as masculine and vice versa right. So there's something about melancholia as like, yeah, loss of opportunities of closed down, close, closed down opportunities for yourself or ways that you don't allow yourself to be. So again, you could sort of see it as more in, in keeping with that kind of not allowing yourself to feel things can, so, can kind of be more the melancholia. Yeah. Like the way this came up for me was, I'll talk about it later, was in a podcast about being here now, like being in the here and now. And that kind of makes mm-hmm. sense then for me that yeah. maybe there is a difference that might be, I don't know whether this is useful for you or not, dear listener, but if that, but for me, if I'm feeling sadness, either because of an event or a memory of an event, or I'm just, something just hits me. Yeah. Um, I'm really, really present. I'm really in that moment. And I'm really mm. just like, I can feel everything. You know, even yeah. though it's even though there's a there might be a grayness and a heaviness, I'm really like, I'm really in my body. I'm really mm-hmm. feeling it. But at times when I'm feeling just kind of like grouchy or disconnected or mm. somewhere else. Maybe that's like melancholia for me. Maybe it's that I. Yeah. That maybe maybe there is a difference there. Um, 
that you might that you might want to think about, dear listener, if that's if this is something that resonates with you. But just the point that we've got to so far is that the um, is the benefits of allowing ourselves to be sad, and that it's uh, natural to be sad and completely um, mm. logical to be sad, and that actually the best way to deal with it is to allow it, yeah, and be it and come out of it, and then. Mm. Yeah. And we can relate it to the current time, I suppose. I feel like, you know, a lot of the problematic stuff that's happened has been around people trying to adapt too fast, mm. you know, to something, to a situation that involves a lot, you know, huge amount of loss on a global scale. Mm. Um, you know, whether it doesn't, whether it or not, it hits close to home for us, you know, mm. the kind of precarities and losses that pretty much everyone's experienced. So this sort of idea of like adapting to, the current situation or making the best of it or like suddenly being really productive or mm. all of this feels like it's sort of again like the, the wider culture just as our upbringings in in this wider culture probably told us it wasn't really okay to be sad or mm. only about some things and not others mm. you know this idea of appropriate sadness um similarly you know we get this message all the time you know and it is this real neoliberal capitalism that we talked about on that podcast mm. the graph always goes up you know mm. up is too happiness to joy to high feelings excitement it's not really okay to hang out mm. in the low places um with with sort of neoliberal capitalism um and again it's uh, there's a, a lot of damage i think if we can't grieve if we can't touch into sadness mm. you know again that it really makes me think about this whole idea of like which bodies and lives and labor are valued and which aren't because if we can't touch into sadness we can't feel that grief of like some groups being put at like way more risk yeah. than others and um you know the the divides between rich and poor and global north and global south and you know all of this um the way of the anim- you know the other way of the species get treated it's like that's that's the thing that mm. connects us to all of that um and to and enables us to you know i suppose it's 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 to me sadness is about connection it's about compassion mm. it connects us to our own vulnerability and that of others and it's such a relief to get there because it's, it's yeah, like underneath all of this stuff that we do to try and protect ourselves from the really hard stuff mm-hmm. is the sadness and to be able to actually feel it, what's going on at the moment. Have we moved ahead to this bit about fighting injustice here? or Because it feels like we're, we're saying some of the things that might be part of this or should we go back to... Yeah, I, I suppose it's, you know, like this is about what we were going to say next around sadness and connection mm, but i yeah. think that you know it sort of feeds naturally into the sense of it it can kind of make us feel connected to other people in a way that makes us want to do something mm. you know i suppose i think about um yeah like how do i feel when i see this these kind of news stories um you know and or see somebody homeless or you know mm. there's that kind of blunting that you can do you know or mm. around thinking thinking about where your food comes from or you know you can just like switch off I don't, mm. don't want to it's too much mm-hmm. it's overwhelmed well, and, and it, sadness gets you to that like I can connect with it I can mm. feel that um, often through connecting with our own vulnerability mm. and the times when maybe we've experienced loss or grief and then we can oh like it is it's like that so the kind of um, reactivity we've talked about on previous podcasts, you know, going into the fight or flight or freeze or mm. fawn, you know, like those are all ways of kind of not going to sadness, I think. That's one mm. way of seeing them. And like, mm. it's about, sadness is a real, you know, this is what my Buddhist teacher, Pema Chodron, talks a lot about. It's like, it's a real place you get to if you can take all the armor off, yeah. you know, get rid of all of those strategies of trying to, you know, trying to make it okay, trying to get really busy, blaming mm. it all on somebody else you know, just going into freeze because it's all too hard, you know, it's like all of that's gone and you're just left with kind of naked, raw sadness underneath it all. I've been doing so much of that um, during the the (laughs) COVID-19 pandemic, you know. I mean, just a a thing here about um, collective feeling Mm. um, that, well, first of all, a, a couple of things. Firstly, because of how poorly our government have handled this, um, it's not been possible for, uh, you know, there have been many, many more excess deaths than, you know, medical yeah. deaths than there should have been. And uh, because we haven't had uh, testing, track and trace, 
um, and not enough testing and not enough tests coming back. Materially, that means that people aren't able to connect with people sad around sadness because they can't go to funerals. Yeah. They can't be there at somebody's in the hospital at somebody's someone's last moments. Um, and so there's been an awful lot of people disconnected from being able to go through those feelings. And for a lot of people, it might be that they can't feel like they can go through mm. that. And so, and more broadly, because we haven't been able to go out in the streets, but also it's difficult, to, we'll come on to this later, but it's difficult, I think, to communicate a sadness for various reasons. Like sadness outwards is a tricky emotion to communicate with others, but something that we can collectively communicate is anger. And mm. definitely this week, with if you're living in the UK, like the Dominic Cummings stuff, like mm. everyone is seizing even people whose politics i despise are agreeing with yeah. me about about this and how we're all being gaslit about it but yeah this but collective sadness i don't think is going to get a look in the only time that i've really thought that collective sadness was a thing was the death of diana you know, mm. things like, you know like that kind of collective we're all grieving and we're mourning um somewhere i think everyone who was there grieving for Diana it was a complicated grieving process and I probably don't want to talk about this too much but you know but I think mm. that people were standing next together next to each other in grief and I wonder whether there's going to be a moment where we can have that because yeah um I think we're going to need it and I think this this thing that you're talking about here of um shutting ourselves off to you know to news stories or just not wanting to go there and and being busy and wanting to do things is definitely something yeah i've been doing and i know a lot of people have been doing but the we're get, we're doing this thing that winnicott was talking about where if we don't just allow it then it becomes something else then it, it mm. will, it's uh it's something we're you know pushing a rug down or a lump comes up in the, in the part of the room and yeah, and I think maybe towards the end of the takeaways, we can talk about ways of doing that, but I think there are ways of opening up spaces. Like before this all happened, I knew of some groups who were doing it around climate change and, you know, this idea of deep adaptation to what to what's coming in terms of climate change mm. and making, like, space to have... Because, again, yeah, if you don't grieve it, you can't move through to this what-can-we-do-about-it place. Mm. Or if you do, it's, it's risky because you're going to be doing it out of all of those reactive places because you haven't really contacted with the feeling potentially so i think that's yeah that's what's really important to kind of allow the grief um and we can we'll talk again about appropriate places of doing that and not uh, inappropriate places of doing that because i think mm. like all the emotions can be expressed in quite reactive ways that mm. then you know do do problematic things and sadness is no exception it can be kind of performed in ways that are unhelpful as well yeah. um yes <laughs> yeah i've read the notes yeah <laughs> <We'll get there. laughs> yeah so do you want to say yeah um about we both had sort of thoughts about sadness as a resource for fighting and because yeah. i think it was just because we were looking at the notes from the anger one and that, I don't know if we'd have thought of this otherwise, but because I was going through those headings and we'd got yeah. anger as a resource for fighting injustice, I was like, wow, sadness as a resource for fighting injustice. And then, it, you know, it made me think, actually, it's a, it's a really important resource for fighting injustice. What did you think? Yeah, I mean, I think that it is. I think it is. But I think that, mm. uh, I, I think in a different way. I think in a more yeah. like long, I think in a, I think over the longer picture, um, I think as part of a process where we're allowing all of the feelings um, mm. to be involved. Um, I think I, w I don't, we, when we talked about anger, we talked about it being an energy and mm. the, the, what Audrey Lord was saying about the symphony of anger and how, mm -hmm. and, and again, what Judith Butler was saying about how anger was being used in a nonviolent way uh, in Black Lives Matter and in, and in Me Too. Um, and we're in the middle of another, you know, the shocking death of George uh, George Floyd. We're going to see this again. I think once the once the initial completely justifiable anger um, uh, subsides, uh, we're going to see hopefully hopefully more of this. But uh, anyway, that's the anger podcast. We're on the mm -hmm. sadness podcast. Um, but I but it, I think anger is also about. Um, 
again, what we talked about it, and again, anger in, in the Pixar film Inside Out. Again, if you're not if you've not seen this film, honestly, you're yeah. missing it. <laughs> it's oh, real yeah. gold. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> um, anger is interested in justice and therefore bound and boundaries and setting boundaries. Yeah. So I think what anger does is maybe gives us space to allow us to feel sad. It, I think it can build. Mm. It helps us to build this. Uh, it helps us with our fortress of. Um, understanding our inner and the outer and I think sometimes we just so need good. to feel safe in that um in the inner and you can't just in the same way that I was saying you know when I'm feeling like I'm having a sad couple of days I'll text people you know I'm putting in like a, a moat around my mm. Mont Bailey castle what I'm turning into a medievalist but um, <laughs> but it is like um but I think that we need to do it because mm. I think that ultimately like sadness is like it I think it is uh it puts me in a place of feeling vulnerable while I'm in it. You know, it's yeah, like I'm not it's very feeling strong vulnerable. during it, but I know that yeah. once I'm through it, once I come out of it, I'll be stronger after. Yeah. As long as we can go through it in as a pure way as possible, as Winnicott was saying, if we can get through mm. sadness without guilt or shame, uh, yeah, or um, anyone trying to just make us feel different things if we can just get through it in that way then we do yeah out the other side more strongly so in that sense i think that that's not something that people are doing enough of right so i don't think people mm. just to talk about left-wing politics again i don't think people have been mourning um the missed opportunities with bernie sanders and jerem corbyn um mm. as left social uh social justice central for social justice from uh, the left mm. there um that we so desperately need um i think um it's not something that um people have had an opportunity to mourn uh probably because of coronavirus um mm. but also it is like a i think it is a, a necessary thing but i think the sorry i've got quite a bit in the notes about this so it's me <laughs> no i like it I don't know. yeah um, carry on the we're, do, we're doing it in a new way aren't we i'm quite enjoying having notes it feels like a it's like a show you know yeah chatting, but there's a bit of us chatting as well can i chip in on the boundaries thing yeah, yeah while yeah. you're there yeah, yeah this idea i love this idea of needing the boundaries to enable the vulnerability because mm. it relates to a lot of what i've been writing about around trauma or reading and writing about and experiencing mm. um well first of all there's this real sense with trauma of we need we've lost care and protection and we mm. need care and protection so care and connection it's all about the vulnerability piece and the protection is all about the boundaries mm. so it strikes me that you're saying that anger and sadness work together like anger is about the protection here's my boundaries and then that enables sadness which is about the care of the self but also the connection with others through that sadness and the vulnerability and then thinking about how they map onto the trauma responses um you know anger is really that fight response which can be good you know it can be yeah. a really useful response right it's the one that's about boundary setting mm -hmm. and it seems like sadness is much more related to me to that fawn response which is a really vulnerable response mm -hmm. that's like trying to please people because i'm really vulnerable and small mm -hmm. so that you know to me those those two parts that when i can access them fawn is very much the part that's related to sadness and vulnerability and um fight very much to boundaries and protection and clarity um and on, on a recent blog i had a kind of conversation between those two parts of me seeing them as you know both necessary because mm. if we can have yeah we can have the boundaries for ourselves, then we can feel the sadness and the vulnerability like you said mm. but also if we've got good boundaries with other people then we're also safe enough to kind of connect with them because we know what's okay and what isn't in terms of how they treat us. Mm. So, you know, I think the, for me, the sadness is that root into the connection with others and feeling their vulnerability and our vulnerability. So it's all about connection, whereas mm. the anger is all about, yeah, protection and boundaries. And we need that mixture of both. So I really mm. like your, your sense of anger and sadness of working really well together. And, you know, anger mm. without sadness is pretty dangerous because we can really just label everybody else wrong and smash people and think that that's okay. With what the sadness does is it humanizes everyone and even, you know, even our souls, we can see like they're coming from that place of reactivity. They're really scared mm. too. You know, it's like it kind of, but, you know, sadness without the anger is just like you're a pushover and maybe you give yeah. everybody too much leeway and you, you don't have those boundaries and you don't stand up for justice because you're too small and vulnerable. So it's like you That's need them back. That's such both. a good way yeah. of That's right? really interesting. Because, yeah. there, because if we're, it's hard to connect with people who 
are angry when you're it's hard to connect with people when you're angry and they're not like if you're not angry about that if you're if the thing that's making you angry they're not angry about then Hmm. it's difficult to connect with them but if you can connect with people around sadness then there is the possibility of social justice because we need connection Mm. in order to yeah in order to get it like activism and politics have we have to be able to be uh making alliances with people i'm not saying that we uh shouldn't punch fascists although yeah but i'm not i'm not saying we should be friends with fascists or sit down and have cups of tea but the possibility Mm. for connecting with people we disagree with around sadness is is there if we can if we but we can only do that if we're in touch with our own sadness right if it's something we just exactly and don't allow into our lives or don't allow into our politics more broadly if we can't connect with it how are we going to connect with anyone else and yeah um, so i think that they are I kind of see, you know, if there was a second a follow-up to um, Inside Out, I would see, like, anger and sadness kind of teaming up, you know. And the anger yeah. Like, Wait a minute. You know, he's, like, standing there in front of his mate Sadness, and it's like, and Sadness is just having a minute, and everyone's just, like, chill. Yeah, um, that's it. And then there are other times when anger has to just go over here, and we have to hear from Sadness, and then the ability mm. for everyone to connect is, like, it is much greater. So, um yeah i completely agree i think those two are really interesting to put into your exposition and like i say i did have that you know you might want to do the same thing of like could you have a conversation between your anger and your sadness like what would that yeah. look like because i think one without the other is risky you know i feel like when i'm sad without the anger i'm just going to collapse you know any criticism i'm just too vulnerable but when i'm you know angry with without yeah with angry about the sad it's like it doesn't have that place of connection and you know you're going to lose allies and you're, you're going to overrule people and you, uh, the, the worst is you become as bad as the thing you're fighting right you know which Big we time. have seen happening yeah Big time. Mm. gosh that's such an interesting point um mm. so um i think the other thing that is valuable about sadness is that if it is like an introspective um thing where we are giving ourselves permission to be slower and being in the moment and noticing things then it gives us valuable information about what's making us sad but it's also, yeah. I think there's a corollary there. I think it's uh, like, it goes in both directions that we, it, we, it gives us valuable information about um, what it is that's making us sad, but also we need the valuable, accurate information about what is making us sad in order that we have, that we're feeling sad about the right things at the right time. Like, so, mm. um, so for example, um, to be sad about the state of the world um, is completely valid because it's, uh, you know, feels pretty rubbish out there um but it is um it is still okay to also think about you know that there has been some progress that the that or that there are there might be some positive things happening or that there that things are a bit better than they used to be in some respect now that's not to say it's not to talk about um uh another term i've learned recently the fallacy of um the fallacy of relative privation, i.e., there's always someone worse off than yourself, or that mm-hmm. cheer up, there's nothing for you to be sad about. You know, that's yeah. bollocks. But it's also just not accurate to basically, it's if you're sad out of inaccuracies, then I think that there is something that is not very political about that. I think there's something a bit yeah. like politics about that if you're not really taking all of your information into account. Also, if you're ignoring some information that you're ignoring uh fat life massive movement at the moment and you're thinking well you mm-hmm. know if you're a kind of idiot who says all lives matter then you have bad politics but um but i think it's important to get the right information but also sadness is an opportunity to get the information about well yeah life. people can play on our sadness can't they as well that makes me think of that like the sort of tugging at the heartstrings kind of stuff um that might give be giving us real misinformation and just really making us you know making us feel bad about stuff without that kind of it being it being legit like we need to yeah i think and then, and that can lead us to quite individualized solutions you know that if we get made to feel a bit guilty and a bit sad you know about um yeah some aspect of climate change or whatever and then you know it it all just turns us into just trying to do our own little bit but it doesn't kind of activate us outwards yeah i suppose there's a a, yeah there's a cluster of things where we're kind of encouraged to feel sad in ways that doesn't really help us to do anything from it no that's a really good point Mm. 
Um, the other thing I should without the information, is, like you say, yeah. yeah. Um, what was I going to say? But you know, just linked to that as well is that you know that in politics and in activism that it it does seem to be um, like cooler or more acceptable to be to be angry and that sad isn't okay. Uh, you know, mm. who goes on Twitter and says, "I'm just really sad about all of this at the moment." You know, it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's kind of less acceptable, like as an outside kind of expression of something. But it's also kind of cool to say things are rubbish. Like a lot of my favorite podcasts, like my favorite pod, one of my favorite podcasts, which is really funny, is Trash Future. And their whole mm. raison d'etre is that everything is really shit actually at the minute. And it's kind of funny. And I'll listen to it and it's funny. I come away with it thinking it's funny, but also like, oh God, everything is a bit shit. And it's like, <laughs> they would never do a podcast and there isn't the kind of the, the culture of, would do, you know, brilliant mm. there isn't a, the, there isn't a culture of you know amplifying really great things which is something you yeah. and i kind of get frustrated about you know we put out all this great content and because we're not dunking on people saying that other people are shit it's less popular but, yeah. but that's just the nature of the world at the moment um, we just say all sex advice is shit and like all relationship advice <laughs> yeah but we don't pick on people do we, we certainly no absolutely yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, well just be careful when you we could do but like it, I just think be careful when you start down that road because where are they coming from? You know, this is my point about sadness. You know, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm. Um, so, but I think coming back to like sadness and melancholia is interesting here. Mm. So I'm going to bring up this idea of left melancholia, which is something that I, I've mm. been learning about um, recently. So, if you remember when I was talking about uh, melancholia, the, the, the difference between sadness and melancholia is that sadness is more about an event and that you feel the feelings and you get through it. And you can go back to feeling sad again in the future about it, but it's not something that stays with you. It's not like a kind of, uh, it doesn't have its own kind of internal memory. It's not something that you are, the, the part of you is like holding on to in that way. Um, yeah. But this, this is also true for like, uh, the, people can be melancholic for a particular way of doing politics uh, in the past, mm. but, uh, but we can't recreate that politics and it's softening us from, from imagining a future. And that's basically the mm. tenet of left melancholia. So there have been many, on the left, there have been many defeats over, over, the, over the years. There have many defeats since I've been a voter for the left over the years. Yeah. And rather than feeling the feelings and going through them and feeling sad and coming out of them, there is instead a kind of a, an ongoing melancholia where there is like a wanting to go back to a time when, uh, you know, there is like mm. a, a longing for the left of the, of the 1960s or, but people forget that the, the, the left that people were longing for was only there for like 20 years. There wasn't that kind of left before that, you know, there wasn't the kind of the left wing politics um, that for, for, you know, for, Giving mm. workers what they needed before the end of the Second World War, or after it was like the 50s, 60s, and the early part of the 70s, that it's something that we were longing for. But it prevents us from being here and now and thinking of new solutions and new ways yeah. of organizing, new ways of seeking out social justice. And I think that's like a really interesting way to. to so, one of the things that we can do is to allow ourselves to feel sad about when we lose or when we're not doing so well, or, mm. you know, if we you know, whatever, and then to kind of, to, to use that as a way of giving us, again, thinking about walls, of giving us some, you know, be, being able to be back, quite boundaries around that and being able to come back to it. But meanwhile, be able to be creative and think about what it is that we need, you know, to yeah. be in the here and now and to be present. Um, to imagine futures and that's where sadness and joy work together again is like allowing the sadness for the past so that you can feel that potential for the future like you can't do the one without the other if you're yeah. stuck in the past because you haven't grieved it and I think that works personally as well mm. you know that we can become very stuck we've certainly been talking about that recently in relation to trans and also mental health stuff that mm. you know when you recognize you know that if you're trans and you could have transitioned years ago, but you didn't, you know, the, the can, you can get very stuck in like, well, I'm never going to get to be that teenage boy or girl or whatever, you know, or I didn't get to be a non-binary child or, you know, you can get quite stuck in what you haven't had, but you know, there's a, there's a certain point which is so important to like grieve that loss. It is a very legitimate loss and one that sure. isn't necessarily recognized, but if you don't kind of grieve it, then it like you're losing the here and now 
and the yeah. potential future right in a similar way and the same can be true like for noticing your stuck patterns or mental health struggles yeah. and you know addictions and how they've come around and again and again it's like you can get very um aware of just how much of your life has kind of gone into that again that, that can keep you kind of stuck in it rather than you've been able to grieve it and but you do get to live now you know it can be really hard to kind of free yourself mm. from the past i think yeah personally and politically i like the way it works on both those levels that we can be so and we see that on the left and the right as well you know there's that real hankering isn't there that real nostalgia for the past whether whether people are left wing or right wing that that it was like the, those better days back then in, um, in the podcast that really yeah. so uh, i'll link to this but the um acfm mm. podcast that uh, i often talk about which i think is brilliant i've learned so much from it it's uh, part of the navara media uh, podcast series uh, it features jeremy gilbert nadia idol and kia Milburn and they were talking about this in their podcast Be Here Now um, which uh, we'll link to but they were kind of talking about they were all saying Jeremy Gilbert was saying this really interesting thing which I shared with you before we started the podcast was that um, Mm. he doesn't have left melancholy he just uh, has sadness so yeah sadness for um, the for uh, the destruction of working class solidarity and that's like after that so because he was old enough to have lived through the minor strike so he's like to, to remember the minor strike we've both lived through the minor strike yeah and so um he says you know every couple of weeks i'll just you know have a bit of a cry i'll shed a tear about what happened during the minor strike and then uh. and then that's it you know and so the way he speaks about it was really interesting but he he was saying he doesn't feel left melancholia, but there is probably a centrist melancholia or a neoliberal melancholia. I think it's really interesting that people mm. haven't accepted, again, this is super political, we'll get back to, I sound really lefty here, but there hasn't been an acceptance by so many people who might consider themselves like centrist or sensible that 2008 happened. Like, mm. graph is not going up. So yeah. neoliberalism was only like working in and of itself when graph, when line went up on the graph. And it mm. can't go up anymore because of 2008. And it yep. we can't, we won't be able to go back to it. So, if there, if anything, there's a they were saying that there's the centrist melancholia, and that really that might be something for 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 people to think more about. That actually there is like a people might need to mourn that you that an Obama or a Blair or a Clinton right now is not going to help. You know, mm. we need something else. Well, absolutely. And it's, I suppose the same with the, this period of lockdown, you know, there's this real potential to mourn those old systems and recognise how broken they were. They always yeah. have been. You know, it's not yeah. that. Yeah, it's like this, the hankering to go back to normal. You know, it's really problematic because normal was so, so bad for so many people and the yeah. planet and other species. And it's like, so can we grieve that? class normal in order yeah. to look for something different rather yeah. than having that sense of like holding on to that normal and sad that we can't have it you know it's a different kind of yeah like you say maybe that more that melancholy is less helpful Such than the important point sadness yeah but maybe what we need to do is grieve the fact we can't have cheap flights everywhere now yeah i think it's really really important again on a personal level mm. families communities wider world it's like mm. can we notice when things have fallen apart and grieve it because mm. then we have the chance to put something else in its place with more solid foundations mm. you know that's that's kind of why you know i talk flippantly about the trauma stuff i'm going through in a sense but that's how i'm experiencing it it's like you know yeah it's really hard but it's a way of like raising something to the ground that was not working and the chance to build more solid foundations and I can feel that kind of happening internally mm-hmm. and the same is like I would invite everybody's like mm-hmm. communities and the wider world to try and do that same like recognizing what's fallen apart and grieve it you know not pretend that it's still there or that we could quickly get back to it yeah 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 and what the sense of all the possibilities of a new normal and a better world as a result of it as Mm. whilst also being able to grieve the yeah grieving the things that we lose that and that they yeah um that's where bringing all the feelings in the joy the sadness the anger the disappointment the, you know we have to be they have to all be accessible to us and we have to be working mm. on that kind of level exactly should we move on to intersectionality and sadness which I, is a super yeah i guess important i section. just yeah i just wanted to like add on to that i suppose again from that more more of a personal perspective of mm. sadness and sorrow um 
something I really get again from Pema Chodron. Like she really talks about sadness a lot as this beautiful thing. She talks about the tender heart of sadness. She mm. talks about start from a broken heart. Like that's the best place to start. Wow. You know, it's really like sadness is, is the like, answer here. It's not like the vase is already broken idea. It's or... more like, um, like sadness is the thing that can, um, like the, the whole point of the kind of, I kind of kind of Buddhism is to try and be the best you can for the world, you know, mm. to alleviate the suffering of the world. Mm. So the only place you can start from is, is feeling the suffering of the world. Mm. So really the thing that stands in the way is everything we do that covers up that feeling, mm. you know, it's like the ways we block. And that's yeah. why um, a lot of those Buddhist meditations do that thing. Like you start with compassion for yourself and then you try and feel it for a close friend and then mm. for a, a neutral person or stranger. And then for someone you find difficult, mm. all those practices which i actually find quite difficult but you know they're all about trying to remove the blocks so that you can feel literally the same kind of the same sadness you would feel for your own suffering mm. or for the suffering of a, a an animal you hold dear or your own right. child or something you'd have that same response to a stranger in a foreign land right right like that's that that's the point because then yeah. we're going to want to alleviate everyone's suffering it's a really similar idea to intersectional feminism really it's like mm. that until until everyone's free no one's free yeah. you know it has to be all of us mm. um and that's the say that's why I, i'm so drawn to those two perspectives i suppose so that so to to the buddhist and pema's the one that like my way into that is like sorrow and sadness is the way into kindness and compassion you know, that's, they're so helpful because mm. if we can feel it and, and you have to feel it for yourself, like it's mm. going to be really hard to feel it from anyone else if you can. And also there's an extra piece I think of that if you can really feel it and if you can really know your own patterns, the way you block it and the things that you put on top of it to stop yourself feeling grief for yourself or for others, then you can also see other people doing it. Mm. So you can even then be sad when you see somebody else doing fight, flight, freeze or fall, like you can spot it much more easily. Mm. Oh, that's what they're doing. And then you can be really sad because they're covering over this beautiful thing that could enable them to connect with others. And we're all caught up in that. And I think that's the big sadness for me, that sort of sense of like, oh my God, I just spotted myself do it. Mm. And then this other person did it, you know, because I was, you know, I lashed out at them and then they lashed out me and it escalated and that's what we're all caught up in and it's just so yeah. shit you know and it's and it's deeply deeply sad that mm. you know that that in, you know on an interpersonal level that person doesn't feel safe enough with us to tell the truth they have to cover it over with bashing out or fawning or whatever and it's also really sad on a global level you know that yeah like whole groups of people just don't feel safe enough to be able to be sad or or express their sadness because you know they're literally not safe enough to do so mm yeah wow, so that's really where... important stuff yeah and it's that thing about spaciousness isn't it and giving people the opportunity like the 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 op just again speaking about well we're going to talk about this a little uh, when we're talking more specifically about intersectionality but it is the the opportunity for feeling sad is disproportionately Mm -hmm. uh even that is dis disproportionately distributed i mean yeah um, unable so, distribution again like who gets yeah. to feel sad who gets to feel angry who gets to feel joy yeah, yeah. like that's so those things whenever yeah they want to. yeah yeah like you're more free to have the full gamut of emotions the more privileged you are yeah mm. yeah okay so uh intersectionality and sadness so um do you want to kick us off on this part mj you got some yeah this is, well, it's what, so this is quite relevant to what's going on at the moment it sort of goes in from what we were just saying i suppose yeah. that sense of like you know there's a potential for sadness to link us to absolutely everything hmm. um like i certainly feel like when I can access that vulnerability I have as a survivor and as a trans person at the moment with me too and the trans moral panic, like when I can really get mm -hmm. in touch with that sadness, it can link me to other people in those communities, but potentially also belong beyond those communities to other people who are being undervalued and treated as if their lives matter less. And it's a nuance to this because you don't want to be saying, you know, all experiences of oppression are exactly the same or, mm -hmm. you know, everything's equally bad or something like that. But I still think there's a place for the feeling, all mm. these feelings, in fact, to connect us. You know, if we feel fear, we can connect with somebody else who feels fear mm -hmm. right now. Or if we feel sadness, we can connect with somebody else who does. Mm. Um, but, you know, 
it's important to think like who yeah who gets to feel sadness and who gets to express it mm. and i'd invite everyone to think about those circles that we often use of like mm -hmm. you know what does wider culture say about people like us with sadness mm -hmm. what do our communities say is okay you know maybe our faith community or whatever like what does our fam what were our family rules growing up you know mm -hmm. and what are our own for us and also those axes of intersectionality it's like what's what's okay for men to do yes this is how it goes <laughs> what's it okay for men and women and non-binary people to do what's it okay in mm. terms of race or faith or uh, sexuality yeah. or disability yeah um and um yeah I, th I think it's okay to mention this because she's put it out as a blog post um there's a blogger and person on twitter called asia small um and was just saying on twitter today um i'm just going to read out the tweets mm -hmm. um for a black person in a predominantly white country, the effects of racism are probably best compared to a form of PTSD, which is why the angry black person narrative is so reductive. Anger is some people's response to trauma. Maybe they want to cry, but vulnerability requires trust. Mm -hmm. And how are you going to trust if you don't feel safe? Mm -hmm. Or if the, the things that you know are very real aren't even acknowledged as happening, like the mm -hmm. gaslighting you were talking about earlier, Justin. Mm -hmm. The closest parallel here may be domestic violence or sexual abuse. And later, um, saying a little bit more, um, she said, maybe it is anger that people are feeling, which is entirely valid, or maybe that anger is a safer way of expressing despair, fear, sadness, shame, or disappointment. Mm. And I thought that really captured it so well of like, yeah. you know, both, yeah, both obviously the dis dismissal of the angry black person, which we so often see, but also like, yeah who gets to who gets who's safe enough to collectively mourn or in what spaces you know maybe it, it simply isn't safe for black people on social media to be expressing emotions other than anger mm. it might be safe within their own communities um you know um so yeah it just seemed really important to have that race piece in there about yeah who gets to feel grief and sadness and who doesn't and where is it safe enough to do so that's uh it's so powerful um mm. It's so, it's the, again, this kind of links to our anger podcast, um, but the, the, and what we talked in there about when, I think we were talking about Judith Butler's idea again, um, about grievability, like yeah. who, um, who is more likely to be grieved, who is more likely to, um, uh, who is allowed to grieve as well. So mm -hmm. who, who, who do we grieve for and who is, um, but also who is allowed to grieve and, and this is the thing is that, yeah, the, this thing about um, the thing that you just read out that I was just saying that um, in order to be sad, in order to, to grieve, you need to be vulnerable and you need, and needs, you need, you need to be trusted. And yeah. Um, but also how do we uh, outwardly express sadness? Like where are this, where, where do we allow outward expressions of sadness, you know, other than mm -hmm. funerals? um you know where where is that okay you know i think it's uh there just aren't enough spaces yeah uh, and also the spaces where they are allowed are again disproportionately um, absolutely uh you know it's yeah and we need to think about you know i was thinking then about you know an obvious place to go there is this concept of white women tears right which mm. is that yeah. you know when there's an encounter often between a black woman and a white woman mm. um you know and a white woman's accused of being racist or you know even even this the vaguest mentioned that they might be you know this sort of yeah. collapsing into tears place um which often takes away all of the folk you know makes it all about them takes away the focus on the, the actual thing that was the problem the bad behavior mm -hmm. in the first place or the system that was poor bad for the the black woman um, i'm reading alison phipps's book at the moment called me not you which is all about the whiteness of the me too movement and how risky that is um, well, that order, that's, great. that's really good yeah so you know it's really important to think about those those intersections of gender and race in relation to me too and just how white women's kind of victimhood gets used in some really dangerous ways so she's mm. talking about you know it's kind of the the, paint, the painting of the good survivor who is usually a young white woman mm. and then calling on the criminal justice system to come in and protect mm. when we know the damage the terrible damage the criminal justice system does mm. um to to black people in general mm. um and also in various other intersections right mm. so um so yeah but, you know, the, the tricky thing with that is like with the white women tears idea, which I've struggled with a little is like, but is that saying, you know, that kind of 
it's not okay to express sadness like if somebody does collapse into tears you know like, mm -hmm. that's kind of my my go-to response often when I'm I feel really bad about hurting somebody so you know what what's the deal there and I think it's um it's about you know it can be done in a really performative way and that really is a problem like if you are really you know that you're doing it and you're just trying to make it about you and trying to get trying to escape legitimately looking at what you've done that's hurt somebody mm. then not okay you know but grief could be and sadness could be a really important part of recognizing when you have hurt somebody else or when the systems you're implicated in hurt other people yeah. and there you know you would want the grief because you don't in a way you don't want people to just be crushed into shame because then they won't do anything they won't mm -hmm. mobilize and they won't yeah. start doing something different so i think there it's a bit like who are the people to express that sadness to you know mm -hmm. like if you've hurt somebody or you violated someone's consent or the systems you're implicated in make life harder for a marginalized group it's not for you in the position of um, the more privileged to yeah. then expect that person to look after your sad feelings. Right. But it is really good to have the sad feelings and to really feel that pain of like, mm. oh my, you know, oh my God, I'm a feminist. Like I'm all about fighting against oppression and I realize I've just been caught in some oppressive practices yeah. or at least in, or at least in not seeing that, you know, somebody else was being hurt. Um, and I thought this, um, I think it's called ring theory or something. It was um, mm -hmm. a, an article a while back about somebody with breast cancer and they were getting so fed up with everyone turning to them for support about mm -hmm. how sad they were feeling about, you know, her, her illness. And it had this, again, concentric circles. And the idea was like the people less impacted go to them for support, like go out, you go out for their to them to support you and then you give support inwards. And I thought that there's something like that could be useful here. It's like, you know somebody tells you you've hurt them especially mm -hmm. in in a kind of oppressive way mm -hmm. it's not you know your sadness doesn't go in to them no. but you ask them to support you through your sadness but you go out to like yeah more privileged people or yeah. the folks around you on a similar level to support you in like oh shit i fucked up mm. how you know what do i do to be accountable for this it may be that person never wants to hear from you and that's okay mm -hmm. you know sort of similar you know again with a consent violation it's like you don't mm. go to the person who survived your consent violation they may never yeah. want anything to do with you but you do go to the people on the same level as you and out and an mm -hmm. outer level to support you through like owning that being accountable making sure you you do better in the future right that's and, so the, and there's a place there's a real place for grief there because my god you know you should that's what you should be feeling is you know yeah. incredible sadness and grief and that's much more helpful and again i'm just going into shame or blame i think to be able to really grieve it that moment where you hurt somebody or somebody got hurt because of your behavior but so politically it's mm -hmm. really important because um i guess i guess in those situations with of white women tears you know white women at a conference mm -hmm. being called out for uh racism however gently it is um mm -hmm. people don't like to you know, that that people's experience of not feeling okay and being told that they're in the wrong or their experience of what looks to them like anger um might just have might put them in react mode yeah uh, so as you were talking about but the but the, but yeah the it's so in that i guess in that situation you just be quiet leave the room find, yeah. find your support people and then but you have to experience it don't you, you have to like go through it you can't yeah slough it off or dismiss it it and this is why, medium, yeah. yeah, and this is part of why call out culture and public shaming are problematic because they often in insist on a really immediate response. Mm. And I think we need to give people time to feel grief and guilt. You mm. know, if people respond immediately, they're likely to be responding much more in that reactive place um, where, yeah, they are going to go into those reactive responses. And none of, you know, none of us probably have a very easy relationship to being called out or told we've made a mistake or anything. So, I think it's like in an ideal world, we'd move to a culture where well, obviously call in rather than call out if possible, mm -hmm. name the behavior rather than saying the person's bad, mm -hmm. but then enabling people to have space to do something. And, you know, ideally that it's the, the people, the people around the person who've got hurt can do the conveying the message rather than the person who's been hurt having yeah. to do it themselves. And then the people around the person who's done it will support yeah. them in fe really feeling the grief and, you know, addressing whatever it was in the most appropriate way. It's yeah. not, there's never going to be a perfect way of handling this stuff, but it's no. certainly not perfect at the moment. Yeah.
Yeah. Um, I'm going to talk about men and masculinity. Mm. A bit. And it's interesting because that thing you're saying about ring theory um, reminds me of you know, the classic situation of a man in a heterosexual relationship that's just broken up. Uh, and who did he go to? Instead of having other outer circles of other yeah. men he could go to, goes to the person he's just broken up with or has just broken up with him. Uh, or the person that he has been abusing, or the person who has been abusing. Yeah. Him. It's like because um, that's the only emotion relationship that he can do those emotions in. Yeah. Yeah. Like so many, uh, work with so many men who's the the only time that they're ever able to feel safe and trusted enough to have any sad feelings or any vulnerable mm. feelings at all was with um, a woman who was doing all this emotional work. Uh, never yeah. has feel her feelings, but um, yeah. more broadly, we're, as we're talking about the intersectionality of um, sadness, that you know, for men, uh, it, crying is so rarely seen. Like we rarely, rarely, rarely see men crying, and it's only ever like seen as okay in very limited set of circumstances, um, and those are coded by the very small number of things that it's okay to get upset about. And I put here football, so. Um, <laughs> Uh, Gazza getting a second yellow card in the semi-final of the 1990 World Cup, England versus uh, Germany, and it was a bad, it was a bad tackle, MJ. It was bad. It deserved a, <laughs> yellow, it? It deserved a booking. But, you know, I haven't, I haven't been listening to this since you said Gazza. I just, I've just gone. <laughs> deserved a booking. He went in and he <laughs> and then he got a red yellow card straight away, and he knew that he wasn't going to be mm. able to play in. Uh, in the final, if we got through to the final, and it's a very famous moment in in yeah, I do remember this culture. And um, I was fourteen. I was I was just distraught when I was watching this, and um, it's like the first time I'd ever seen a man cry. And wow. we're all watching it, like you know, so many people in the country are watching this man crying on the pitch. And Gaza says, you know, I'll have a word with him to uh, Bobby Robson. It's like Gaza's going, can I have a word with? Uh, Gary Lineker's going to go and have a word with Gaza and he's crying and it's on the pitch and we're going to get beaten and it's awful. It's like, that's the only, that's like the only wow. time it was okay when I was growing up for men to be sad, which is like, that's and it's astonishing, just isn't it? Fucking football match, but, you know, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> and all the horrible nationalist jingoism that came with that. But anyway, uh, yeah. Oh, I look back. Oh. Uh, anyway, but, um, and the other times when it's okay as well as if, um, Man, it's okay for a man to be sad if he's uh, if he's experienced a loss. So, for example, if uh, mm. someone being a dad, you know, maybe they they've lost their kid or something, or they've experienced some kind of like awful traumatic event, then it's kind of coded mm. as okay because they are like a provider and a protector, and you know. Yeah. And so it's like it's, but even then, there are limits to how much men are allowed to be okay, and it goes back to what you were saying earlier about. Um, about um, uh, like the angry black person narrative um, mm. and how um, you know if we want men more broadly to be um, uh, to be more uh, to be able to express sad emotions, we need to as a culture do something about it. And that's yeah. not asking. That doesn't mean that we ask individual men to be more sad uh, openly, but we would have to create a culture where it's more okay. But mm. The masculinity donut, which is what I talk about at my website, Fish, where I would say that uh, that men are donuts, that, uh, that there is the dough of the donut, which is all of the learned behaviours of how it is you're supposed to do masculinity. So being uh, tough mm. and uh, uh, competitive and best than others and um, to uh, all that kind of stuff. Um, that's all like okay masculinity. I'm putting it in certain commas, but the not okay masculinity are all the emotion stuff, like which mm. is the jam of the donut, and that men do an awful lot of work to prevent jam from spilling out because it's seen as not okay, and so uh, you get these very unpleasant donuts where it's all dough and you're feeling pushed <laughs> into the corner of a room as the dough expands, um, in order to protect this jam, which you know the, the man is doing everything you can to keep inside some and sadness is very much in the jam of the jam donut. yeah and so yeah. so much dough can be and then it's just doing more and more damage to everybody it's doing yeah. damage to the family it's doing damage in culture and you know this is where the this idea of toxic masculinity means that um that we're just not really it means that change just becomes harder and so you know yeah. there, so as it's less okay for um men to do sadness 
um, it means that there is less work, less of this kind of work that we've been talking about can, getting done. Like sa if sadness is at least as necessary as anger, and yet all, mm. all men are encouraged to do, and the only kind of emotion it's okay for men to do is anger in the broader culture, then it's doing a number on everyone. But yeah. also I think crying generally and sad gen being sad generally, I think in the culture is seen as a weakness. Like it's seen as yeah. that even where uh, women or anyone who isn't a man does it, it's kind of like, it's still not seen as being brilliant, but it's just more okay because it's more un understandable because if you're not a man or if you, certainly if you're a woman, then your position is weaker. And it's like, it's understandable, even though it's not cool because the thing that we, again, mm. try and go up, the, 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 the values that, we uh, seem to um, value as a culture are aggression and hardness and toughness and stoicism. That's right. And this is why it goes back to vulnerability, doesn't it? It's like, yeah, it, it's really not okay to show vulnerability for anybody, is it? And it's like, and it's just this weird um, polarization of vulnerability and strength yeah. when really it's, you know, it's far stronger to be vulnerable and to show vulnerability, that takes so much strength and so much courage to do. It's incredibly hard. Well, Whereas, fact, you know, yeah. being being just bulletproof and hard is not that difficult for a lot of people. It's, you know, like to actually show vulnerability, but we're so encouraged to cover it over. Yeah, yeah like really not seen as okay. Just, oh, it wouldn't be great if we could just cry in the street and if we could just see people in tears just as much as we see people laughing or having a shout, you know, it's just, yeah. it would be such a good world, right? And for it not so, I mean, if I saw someone crying in the street, it's so rare that I'd be like, "Oh, what do what what should I do here?" Like this is, yeah. feels like an emergency, and actually, it's just a it's just a feeling, and that's it. Yeah, you get to that. I mean, again, it's just it's this paradox that we talked about at the beginning of the show about three and a half hours ago. <laughs> <laughs> we said we morning when we began this podcast. <laughs> when when Winnicott was talking about this as a paradox that um, you know that it's seen as something that we need to dismiss and negate and the more we do it the less mm. strong we're going to come out of it as a result. Um, there are going to be kind of ongoing vulnerabilities. You know if you think about if we think about James Bond and the, the opportunity for James Bond to be sad so we've thought about time. donuts and James Bond in the last 10 minutes. Favorite so I'm just things. loving this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I guess a useful yeah. kind of uh, thought experiment for you to take away, dear listener, would be, you know, next time you see a depiction of like a, a hard man doing hard things, if it really mm. is that tough, if, the, if, it's, if, it's, if it is this kind of like bulletproof Teflon toughness, imagine an alternative story where he's going through all the sadness, all the feelings, but he's particularly been able to deal with sadness and grief mm. and loss and come out of it and then come out of it stronger like you know yeah. maybe that's the thing we have to like just imagine because we'll certainly never see it with them um, in the next bond film you know he's sad it's for like two minutes and has a whiskey and or a yeah martini and then well every bond they they do like oh finally a more vulnerable bond and then you watch him and it's just like oh no you know he was like oh, okay wow. yeah timothy dalton was a little bit more um yeah. vulnerable than uh Roger Moore and then the Daniel Moore Craig was a little bit more <laughs> vulnerable than Pierce Brosnan you know yeah. Pierce Brosnan wasn't vulnerable no I, I can't, <laughs> I'm not sure I could adequately describe Pierce, Pierce Brosnan <laughs> anyway it was a step a step backwards I think <laughs> Sean and Daniel all the way as far as I'm concerned <laughs> Uh, I think that Roger Moore is oh, God. Uh, criminally <laughs> underrated as a Bond. I think the films were bad. bad <laughs> They're I, really bad. Bad films, but I think he was a yeah. good Bond. Okay. Yeah. But we can agree to disagree. <laughs> I'll do a raised Roger Moore eyebrow. eyebrow uh, Funny, I could raise one eyebrow. Raising. I would love that. <laughs> right. We're on the final section. Um, we're yeah, takeaways. Some takeaways. Uh, yes. so some things to um, so we've talked a bit about some of this but it's nice to kind of round things up with what mm. uh, how to move forward with this so MJ yeah I guess yeah. it's about yeah it's about anything that we can do to get in touch with our sadness um, and with these kind of feelings of fragility vulnerability sorrow grief just allowing them as much as possible mm. so the stay with feeling scene has some suggestions in 
um, anything you can do to just like be with the feeling and often like going to what are the sensations in the body and really trying to breathe into those can be good. Um, but for a lot of people, it's much more helpful to have witness though and to do it collectively, like you said. And I think, you know, a lot of field people do find it much easier to cry in therapy, for example, than on their mm-hmm. own. Um, so, you know, therapy and other forms of support can be really good to make space to just to do that grieving and sadness. Um, and as I said, like sharing circles can be a really good one. Um, they're, you know, more financially accessible and just everybody having five or 10 minutes to share how they're feeling about stuff that's going on at the moment, or maybe even specifically sharing about sadness, um, can be a really good one. And then there are those more like Buddhist meditations where, you know, Pema always suggests start with something that really cracks you open. So she uses Mm. the example of, um, her teacher seeing, um, an, an animal being really hurt and, um, you know, he just always could go back to that moment, you know, that he couldn't do anything about it. And he was seeing this and just seeing the pain in the animal's eyes. And like, it doesn't matter what you start with, but something that can elicit that feeling of sorrow and kindness and compassion in yourself. And then like doing that work of trying to extend it out. And and she says, it's not, it's not like you're trying to like, oh, I need to be compassionate to everyone. Um, Oh, you know, I tried expanding out to my friends and I couldn't even feel sadness for them or compassion for them. So I'm mm. failure. It's much more like, oh, where am I blocked? You know, mm. OK, so I started with the dog. Then I tried to feel it for myself. I could kind of feel it for myself when I was five. but I couldn't really feel it for myself as a teenager or tried to feel it for Justin. And I managed him. But then I tried some other friends and <laughs> it sort of shut down. Like, you know, what's it about Justin that he can elicit my sadness when my other friends can't? Or, you know, I could manage it for my friends, but not for strangers. Or, mm. you know, where's the where the blockage? And that's just really, you know, get curious about that. It's not like right and wrong. We're all going to shut down on sadness in, in various places. Yeah. And it's like, again, really the important thing is to notice where we shut down and like interrogate that and spend time on it. There's no, no one who's going to be able to just be able to feel this for the whole world. But, you know, do we shut down? Yeah. On people who are not like us. Or do we shut down? Are we all right with anyone who's a victim? But we shut down when we try and think about anyone who's ever perpetrated. You know, again, mm-hmm. intersectional feminism would say we always need to connect with the oppressor in ourselves because we've all got it. So mm-hmm. if we struggle to um, connect with a, any kind of oppressive behavior, that probably means we're more likely to do it rather than less likely. So it's sort of like, can we feel the pain of everyone caught up in all of these dynamics? That would be where we're, where we're trying to get to, albeit it's a lifelong journey. That's a really interesting. I think that's point. it. Yeah. yeah. Um, a lot of people say, just to talk about the news as well, a lot of people say that they just kind of switch off the news or avoid news. And I think that, you know, there is good self care practice to be had in that. I think there's only mm. so much news. But there yeah. is currently news. There is the, the, the George uh, Floyd um, killing. Uh, yeah. in the US is news happening at the moment I think that the thing is is that even if even though we're overwhelmed with news overwhelmed with news and also overwhelmed with the potential to be sad I think that it is important to to allow or, or to allow yourself to give yourself permission to feel sad about something which we should feel sad about I think it's exactly just, I think it's just good practice and I think that yeah. that is a thing that we could feel sad about. And I think it's a thing we, we might, could feel yeah. sad about, but even, I think if we, we might feel anger about it and a hopelessness about it, but the only way to do anything about it ultimately is to at some point feel sad about it because it's only yeah. through going through the feelings of feeling sad and we come out the other side with the resources to be able to do something about it. Yeah, and you might think about like how you navigate that for yourself, I suppose. You know, yeah. it, it goes back to that self-care thing of like what we engage with, mm. you know, like the maybe ways of engaging with news that ensure, you know, that we get the stuff that we really need to know about and yeah. that we do make contact with these really important moments um, as well as, you know, protecting ourselves. I thought, well, I think you said it really nicely, you know, something about like get, get the news story, but don't get all of the hot takes, you know, yeah. and don't get overwhelmed with like being on social media and what's everyone saying about this. But, you know, maybe you could use that, you know, maybe you could use that time. Maybe it's much more about like, here's the, here's the story. Here's what happened. Now I give myself 15 minutes to feel sad about it or an hour to really, you know, connect with that sadness yeah um you know or Maybe days or weeks depending on how much it yeah exactly like actually allowing the sadness because in a way just getting a 
that can be one of the ways we avoid the sadness, isn't it? Like to try and just hear everybody else's thoughts about it. Mm. And also it's okay if you can't reach sadness, you know, because you're just overwhelmed with anger first and foremost or fear or, Mm. you know, because it hits so close to home that sadness feels too, too dangerous to go to, or you haven't got safe enough others. Mm. And I suppose that, that would be another thing for takeaways is, you know, can we think about who our sadness posse are, you know, like yeah. who are our go-to people? Like, can we have that conversation with them about how we want to be around each other in sadness? Yeah. Mm. And can we have, um, can we just open up conversations about sadness with people? Can we, you know, is there someone that we know that we have a collective memory of sadness about and mm. that we could open up a, you know, not that we want not suggesting that we necessarily might value from like making everyone feel sad when we're sad because there's something very non-consensual about that but um Mm. but just to be able to connect with someone who you know might have had some or might will have some sad feelings about for example someone that you've lost or something Um, yeah and the ability i think it will it's just about also being as an honesty thing here as well isn't there it is Mm. just about being honest and avail about our feelings and allowing them to be available to us but allowing us to be able to speak about, about them with other people because then also we're modeling with other people mm. that it's okay to have those feelings and ultimately that comes back to what we, where we started with, with Winnicott which is that you know if parents allow their kids to be sad then they build the resources and the capacity to be sad more easily and yeah they build the resources to be sad, feel sad, and come through it. And so yeah. it is more, it is, it is a practice thing. Mm. Yeah, um, exactly. That, um, and I think, you, you know, neuroplasticity suggests we can relearn different relationships with sadness, you know, in our bodies and our brains as well. So I think there's hope to be had. But yeah, I like your, uh, the person you were saying who was making a time for sadness or mourning, you know, every couple of weeks. It's a, you know, yeah, I talked Jared a bit Hill. about, yeah. yeah i talked a bit about again buddhist practices of like regretting things every two weeks you could make space for gratitude regret mourning you know whatever you know just going yeah. over a vivid memory of a time where you were sad that, of, of something that you just yeah like just over the last mm. couple of minutes i've been think just reminding myself of how it felt to be at my dad's uh wake and that Mm. there was definitely there was joy there there was you know laughter but there was also there, there was definitely you know everyone's feeling sad it's like oof, mm. really remember that oof, of, you know, yeah and it, it kind of gave me permission to feel sad and it was it was okay and uh and everyone else was and there was something really beautiful about it as well there really so. there really often is at these kind of collective grieving mm. you know often funerals but other spaces where everyone gets to feel sad mm. and the other thing you can do for yourself if there were times in the past where you didn't get to is revisit those memories and feel for for you now mm. and that can be again part of that kind of recovering from trauma can be allowing yourself to grieve those moments they probably be you know less like um yeah constantly there like you were saying i guess about the melancholy you know, it's like you can let them go a little if you're able to grieve them, even if you didn't get to grieve them back then. Mm. Mm. That sounds on sadness then, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. Next up, fear slash disgust. <laughs> <laughs> but I like we've got, we've got anger, joy and sadness down now. <laughs> yeah, we yeah. despair and hopelessness as well. Yeah. Well, we hope you enjoyed that one enjoyed valued <laughs> anyway that episode dear gentle fragrance uh and textured and smooth and silky listener and viewer of course any feelings you had were entirely valid and we hope that you are able to feel them <laughs> yeah i mean let's yeah. i hope you found it useful let's say that yeah that uh, would be nice <laughs> yeah <laughs> um so um Again, some uh, very quick plugs for where you can find more of our stuff. If this was the first of our podcast you've listened to, we've got a ton of others on this kind of thing and also um, more stuff about sex, (laughs) (laughs) Um, which is how we started. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Sad sex. It's a thing. Sex, yeah. Uh, Mm -hmm. Who knew? Uh, And that's all you can find all of that at um, megjohnandjustin.com, including loads of uh, excellent blogs. Uh, you can find the rest of our content at patreon.com forward slash Meg, John and Justin, 
software from just a dollar a month, although ideally more if you have it, but as, from as little as a dollar a month, you can have access to all of our exclusive shows on Patreon, you know, Patreon works by now, hopefully. Um, you can tweet us at Meg John Justin, and we're on the other social medias, but yeah, social media is a con, isn't it? We're not really into it, but you can contact us at social, at uh, <laughs> Twitter, uh, and do send us a message if, you, message if you have any questions for, or any topics you'd like us to cover in any upcoming shows, again, via the contact page at megjohnandjustin.com, where finally you can also find our publications, uh, we've got some zines about relationships and sex and uh, fantasies that you can buy for £2.50 each. And you can buy a book, uh, A Practical Guide to Sex. That's right, isn't it? They've renamed That's it. right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it's a uh, handy pocket size. You can put it in as we go on a trip to Scotland <laughs> to meet your lover after, <laughs> after coronavirus when you're allowed. <laughs> When you're allowed on a train again, if you ever want to go on a train again. That would be again. nice, wouldn't it? I would love to go on a train again. <laughs> I'm, I'm done. I'm fine not going on a train. Really? <laughs> <laughs> the whole world is so scary oh. right now. Oh. Oh, <laughs> but yes, oh, maybe point. when the world feels safer, I will be on that train yeah. with my tweed jacket. <laughs> <laughs> all right then. So until next time. Yeah, thanks bye. all. Bye. Bye, dear YouTuber. Bye, 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 bye. Where's the stop button? Where's the stop button? Keep waiting until <laughs> I find the stop button, MJ.